Do you want to click on that? Sweet. We're on. We're on. G'day everybody. Hi Warwick everyone. Schiller here with the lovely Jane Pike. That's me. <coughs> <coughs> we've got lots to talk about. We do have lots to talk about. Yeah, yeah. We've um, we just got back, what, two days ago? Or was it yesterday that we got back? I have no idea. I've it's lost track of time. It's all a whirlwind. <laughs> yeah, so we are live on multiple platforms at the moment. We're on Confident Rider, my page, and we're on Warwick's page as well, Warwick Schiller Performance Horsemanship. And, and over here, I believe, we're on Instagram. Yeah, <laughs> we're <laughs> testing out Instagram. We're testing out live on Instagram. It's all happening. So good morning, everyone. Um, I'm going to introduce you really briefly, Warwick, because there might be some people on my page who have... Um, either not been following it for a while or not quite sure or up to speed with what's been happening. Okay. So we've just got back from uh, the World Equestrian Games and Warwick and his amazingly fabulous wife Robin were both competitors as part of Team Australia's reigning team and they both got their highest scores ever, round of applause, in competition which um, I still pretty much put up there as the highlight of the couple of weeks for me it was just the best thing ever um, so that's we're, and we're back now and um, thought we would sort of jump on and have a talk about our experiences and what led up to it basically and so for people on my group who the one person on my group out of the 20,000 something people in my group that may not have heard of Jane Pike Jane is a horse riding mental coach and she's been helping Robin and I for a while now um, with um, our mental preparation for the for the World Equestrian Games. Yeah. <laughs> so um, Warwick posted on the group yesterday, or in his group, asking if you guys had any questions about, um, or for both of us, while we were both in the same location and could take advantage of it. And um, we noticed kind of some, some common threads that were coming up. Um, Montana the says the that. volume's a bit low. Is it? Can you project? Project, yes, I can. Um, so Warwick posted in his group about asking for questions and um, we noticed a theme or a common thread that was running through some of those questions, which was basically everyone was looking for like the one thing that was the thing that made the difference. And Warwick mentioned um, over the course of WEG that he was using a breath technique that um, I mentioned to both Warwick and Robin and ran through with them over the course of our time together there. And also that we had a safe word that was something that um, we used to intercept us if we ever found ourselves getting off track or um, running down a negative path. And those were the two things that were coming up time and time again as something that people were, were wanting to know about and um, I guess kind of latching onto as the reason right. <laughs> as to why things felt good and went well um, over the course of the game. Yeah, where these came from was the other day, Horse and Rider magazine. So next year I'm doing uh, a monthly series of articles in Horse and Rider magazine here in the, in the US. And so the lady from Horse and Rider magazine did a Facebook Live on the Horse and Rider page and had Robin and I interview each other. They thought it might be cute if we interviewed each other. And in that I did mention that Jane had helped us with a, uh, a breathing technique. And what was the other thing you just mentioned? The safe word. Oh, yes. Yeah. And, yeah. and I said, oh, it's been fun here. I said, part of, a big part of um, what we got out of having Jane around is she's so positive and, and she tried to keep everything positive. And if at any point in time our conversation, so someone, someone kind of took, sorry, I'll go on with it. I said, we had a safe word if we, had, if we started getting on the negative and someone said, oh, well, we want to know what the safe word was and how it affected you when your mind started getting negative about how you felt about yourself and your preparation. There wasn't any of that. It wasn't about that at all. It was just about we were trying to stay positive in general. So if we saw someone who was doing something silly or acting in a bad way or whatever and one of us started buying into it and wanted to talk about that particular person, we had this safe word. It was just, hey, let's keep it all... Positive. So it wasn't really, there wasn't, the safe word wasn't really for any of our... It had no intrinsic power. Well, and like, it was, the safe word was water. was water. <laughs> and the beauty of that safe word was, on the very first day of the road trip, I was practicing my American accent, which is impeccable, if I can just put that out there. 
And um, water was the word that I was saying over and over again. Your so American accent like, is impeccable if you have to ask Rachel to water the horses. Let's just be Just one sentence. I can't, I can't do it without a prompt, but water, water was like the, the word that we used, yeah. Come on, can you ask Rachel to water the horses in mm. your American accent? Well, it's the specific, I have to actually say the specific sentence, that Rachel, can you give the horses some water? So yes. that would be my natural way of saying it. Rachel, can you give the horses some water? <laughs> that was very good. Thank you, That's yeah, thank you, thank you. I'm so going to get one that. of the little trophies over here and give yeah, it to yeah. you for an Emmy. I will gratefully accept that, yeah. Mm. <laughs> So that was, that was it. It was kind of a, um, thank you, Cindy. Yes. <laughs> Hi, Gillian from Scotland. So cool. Speaking so of accents. If, if as we're going as well, you have questions, I'll grab my laptop after and we can kind of have a scan through them. So Warwick's reading them as we go. Um, so I guess the thing that we really wanted to, to highlight was process, um, was the fact that it was never one thing. There is never just the one thing that makes the difference. There, it, it can be a one thing that allows you to get your headspace back into the right place that you need it to be in that moment in terms of being a prompt or a trigger. But your ability to do that only comes as a result of having put in the work prior. And if you haven't put the work in prior, Doing a breath technique, will it will help, but it's not necessarily going to be the thing that really creates a difference between, you know, getting out there and being able to create your best best run ever at the World Equestrian Games. What, what do you say to that, Warwick? Uh, yeah, and we can talk about the breath technique that... Um, yeah, that's not a that, secret. That, ...that Jane showed me. We can talk about that in a minute. But um, I think, I mean, it was, it's been a year-long preparation for me, um, and that breath technique was just the icing on the cake. I went, I went to the games in a very good mental state about my preparation, the horse's preparation, and then just when I start, if I started to get nervous, which means I was starting to think about tomorrow or later today or whenever it was I was, I was competing, um, that breath technique just helped bring me back to the present. But it, you know, it would be pretty much useless without all the previous work. If you hadn't done all the previous work, it's kind of, I, Jane and I were talking about it yesterday, and it's kind of, I, I said it's a bit like a flying lead change. The first time you ask a horse to do a flying lead change, it's very, very easy if you've done all the work and the horse is ready for it. But if you've not done any of the work and you ask a horse exactly the same way, all you get is a horse that sticks its head in the air and probably runs away. <laughs> and so it's kind of useless yeah. on its own. Like any, yeah. any, I think anything is, really. Yeah. And I mean, even the work that we do in terms of both of us have subscription platforms and the reason that I chose to work in that way in the first place wasn't a business decision. It's the <coughs> fact that I think that you get the most value out of the work if you follow a process and there's support along the way and there, it's, a, it's progressive. That's the reason it's structured that way. And so, you know, following a plan and following a process is both a huge part of like horse horse training and people training, you know, the parallels are so similar. Oh, I think it's, it's not just training, it's, it's anything, like, you know, yeah. it's being a good cook, it's being a good mechanic, it's, be, it's, it's how to build anything, it's how, I talk about a lot, how video games are made. It's life. Yeah, it's, ba it's basically <laughs> it's a life, life principle and, um, yeah, I, it's one, and once you get your head around it, it's, it's quite easy to apply to a lot of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, once you stop compartmentalizing it, thinking, oh, that's just for when you go to school, or that's just for when you're cooking, or that's just for when you're playing a video game. Yeah. Um, once you realize it's it's basically just how life works, then it's it becomes a whole lot easier. It's really a, I think it's really a paradigm shift. It's really yeah. in um, how you look at things. Yeah, it's definitely a paradigm shift, and then it's a a muscle that you build. So just like building a physical muscle, you're building mental muscles that allow you to continually focus on the positive, to reframe things in a context that empowers you, and to manage your self-talk essentially so that it's supportive of those <coughs> outcomes also. So that you're, you know, it, it's the, the way, way thoughts work is that they build on themselves. So the more negative thoughts you have, the more, the more easily you can create more negative thoughts and it takes you in that direction like a tumbleweed. But the reverse is also true, like the, the hardest shift is actually the transition. But once you've made the transition and you're able to sustain that and build your focus in a specific direction, it becomes much easier to create momentum. 
I, the, the analogy I use, and this is a really good one for San Francisco or being in San Francisco yesterday is, you know, if you've got a car at the top of a hill and you take it out of, you, you pull off the handbrake and you put it in neutral and you give it a little shove, it's much easier to stop at the top. You know, if you were just to stop it just directly after, it's, after it started rolling, it's much easier to intercept it and to change the pattern of energy at that point. But if you let it roll down the mountain and you let it go down towards the bottom and you try to stop it at that point, it's so much harder because it's gained momentum and hey, it's started to, started to get its own energy and build on itself. And it's the same with our thoughts. So the quicker or the more mindful you become of uh, intercepting your own thought patterns when they're not serving you, the easier it becomes to intercept them and to change the direction or change their course. But if you've got into a habitual pattern of allowing those thoughts to run rampant and you're not really in the driving seat, then the, sa the reverse happens. You know, the, the same happens in the opposite direction, basically. Yeah, and um, you know, it all sounds well and good when Jane says it like that, but it is a lot of hard work. Um, when I, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> when I showed at the games this year, I was, I was actually amazed at how. I mean, how easy it was, like how easy it was to be in that mental space. But I've, I've spent this year, uh, you know, Jane's helped us some, and I've actually been seeing a therapist all year. And a lot of the stuff that the therapist had me work on is the same sort of stuff Jane had, has people work on. It's the mindfulness practices. But what, Jane said a word there a minute ago that made me think of this, but the big thing, one of the big things I got really out of the therapy this year was being non-judgmental. And it's not until I really started to point that out to me that I realised how, um, you know, how much self-judgment we have. Mm -hmm. And I think that whole self and I think it's kind of on a subconscious level too, that, that when you start to reframe that, uh, that self-judgment stuff, I think that makes a huge difference. And, and I, until, I still, you know, until I started down that path, I didn't realise, I didn't even realise I did it. Yeah. It just it's part of who you are and it's probably part of how you're raised or whatever, but I didn't even realise I had that level of self judgment. And what I realised is once I started to work on that and be aware of that, um, you know, because we talked about the safe word a minute ago, when I go to group therapy, if anybody says something that's judgmental about themselves, everybody goes, That was judgmental and you go, Dang, it was ooh. too, you know. Yeah. Um, but I have, re I have really noticed that since I've done that with my, t my dog's <laughs> carrying a big stick, he's gonna knock the camera over. Um, since I've done that with myself, I realized, hey, I'm a whole lot less judgmental about other people too. So it's, I think that whole reframing of that, you uh, self-talk is what you said, I think. Yeah. Um, I think it's a, you know, it sounds really easy when you spit out your really lovely words that you say, but it is a lot of hard work because I don't think we, I don't think we know we do it. Yeah, but it's harder work to not do it. Oh yes, <laughs> but, but that's the whole paradigm shift. Yeah, yeah. Like, so leading up to the like, I have not done anything different with my writing this year than yeah. I've done before. It's not like I, wow, I, you know. So you said we had Rob and I had our best scores ever at the games. Not only did we do that, we had our best scores ever in the first round. So we never thought we'd, so at the World Equestrian Games in the rain, I think there were 63 competitors in it from different countries. The top 15 from the first round go straight to the individual final. Uh, the, the, the individual scores from the first round count up for the team medal. Uh, Australia, the Australian team ended up eighth in the medal. Um, so the top 15 go straight to the finals and then they have a consolation round the next day where 16 place through 35th place get to go again and then the top there's only five of them go back which makes up 20 horses in the finals and we never expected to make the consolation round you know we are our horses uh, cost a fraction of a lot of the horses there so so our our whole goal was to go there and do as good as we can get our horses shown we're not trying to beat anybody we're just trying to be as good as our horses could be. So we didn't expect to make the consolation round. Then we made back to the consolation round. And then I, and so in the consolation round, we both betted our previous personal bests in the first round. Um, and I didn't actually, you know, it's not like all of a sudden I had a newfound riding skill that I hadn't had before. 
Um, I don't think I was doing any different writing than I had before. It, I really think it's the whole, the whole mental thing this year. It's just, it just amazed me at how, I don't want to say easy, but it was easy. Mm. Mm. Well, I loved being a part of it and it just kind of popped into my head when you were talking about best scores and that sort of thing is that the, one of the coolest things was that the success metric, I guess, or that feeling of success was so independent of everyone else or placing or anything like that. It was literally about you guys on your horses and having that experience and getting that score. And no matter where the ranking ended up or anything like that, the jubilation was so strong because that the framework was literally like for you, like you were out there for you competing for you and your horse. Right. And the result was, you know, reflective of that. And the feeling was so addictive. It was amazing. It was such a, a wonderful thing. Any questions? Yes, Elio Brain says, what about when we assume that people are judging us? That's really just us judging ourselves. Yeah, that's, I don't know if that's the case, but for me, I think one of the, um, one of the problems I've had in the past, so I, don't, I haven't shown in the rainings for the last three years now, I don't think, so I went back to showing this year, and I really feel that in the past I didn't show very good, you know, they, they say, some, you know, people will either train better than they show or show better than they train, and the really, really good guys can do both really well, and I think I've always trained better than I've shown. And I really think the showing part was being worried about what they will think, whoever they is. Um, and I think this year, I, I mean, there was no they for me, you know, that um, I didn't really, there was no they in the picture, so... And I think that's part of your ego, like you, and, and I don't mean ego as in you think you're really good. Just the ego as in being inside your head and, and thinking about what people are thinking of you, whether it's good or bad or, or, or otherwise. But yeah, that wasn't there this year. So, it was, but it was, so my big deal was to get, I was excited to go there and compete again with a different <laughs> mental framework than I've ever had before. And it's, you know. It was worked. cool. <laughs> it worked out. It, it was really, really cool. cool. <laughs> I'm like still got the feeling of cheering on the sidelines. Once I, I this was my first reigning competition. I've set the bar high. <laughs> and once I learned coming from a, an English background that you could like whoop and holler. By the time I got to the second round, I was on fire with my uh, cheering technique. So it was so <laughs> I can remember exactly what it was like. Yeah. So if you guys have seen the the footage, so it was um, I was on FEI TV. And so they had multiple camera angles. So they'll show the run from, you know, they'll show the whole horse and they'll show, like if we're standing in the middle, show the rider's face and then they'll show it from one angle. Then it'll show the people cheering at the back gate. Jane's in the highlight reel. She's doing a whole lot of <laughs> yes. jumping up and down Unleashed, there. it's like Jane Unleashed. Yes. <laughs> so awesome. Um, very cool, right. So we're gonna talk about this breathing technique? Yeah, yeah, we'll talk about the breathing technique. So I think, Breathing is something that we really overlook and one of the reasons why it's so powerful is uh, it's one of the very few things or the few things that we can do that is within both our conscious and unconscious control. So if you forget about your breathing, you breathe anyway. And as soon as you start to exert conscious influence over the breath, you have to give that your one-pointed focus. You have to give that your one-pointed attention. And that's where breath techniques are so powerful in that they are a meditation and a, uh, they exert really tangible influence over your nervous system all in one go. So it's like this beautiful package. Um, you'll notice that if you are feeling anxious or upset or you feel a little bit kind of outside of yourself, then your breath mirrors that pattern and it becomes much shorter, much sharper. You tend to breathe in the top part of your body so you'll feel tighter in the chest or in the shoulders and that's where the breath originates. So you kind of lose that ability to, for really long, deep breaths. Um, just as a bit of a backstory, the exhalation is linked intrinsically to your parasympathetic nervous system and your inhalation is linked to your sympathetic nervous system. So that kind of uh, build up or fight and flight response is a sympathetic response. You might see people when they're about to have a fight, for instance, or you'll see boxers on TV or someone in a movie that's getting really psyched up and they'll be like, <laughs> they take really sharp breaths in, breaths in and they hold it. And that's kind of like a, a, a pump up energizing breath. 
And so if you're wanting to really activate that parasympathetic response, then it's the exhalation that primarily you're wanting to focus on. So one of the big techniques that I teach, um, separate to the one that I was talking about with Warwick and Robin, is the one-two breath ratio, where you double the length of your exhalation in comparison to your inhalation. So if your inhalation is four counts, your exhalation is eight, eight counts. And the, <coughs> excuse me, I've got a nut stuck in my throat. The dual advantage of that is not only are you activating the parasympathetic nervous system as the dominant, um, dominant system, but you're also requiring yourself to focus on, well, how long is this breath? How long is that breath? And that provides you with what I call a pattern interrupt. So that allows you to interrupt a pattern that might be cycling out of your control, break that for a moment, and then redirect your focus towards what it is that you want. The breath work that we did together is called, um, it's a, a breath that I learned in yoga. So some of you will be really familiar with this already, but it's an alternate nostril breathing technique. Um, and way back in a past life, I did a lot of work on um, a lot of breath work and um, I'm a yoga therapist as well. So this formed a lot of my, my previous um, studies. So in yogic literature, I guess, or in Eastern philosophy, the left side of the body is related to the lunar side, the cooling side, and the right side of the body is, is the more heating sun side. But regardless of how deep you take it, Basically, um, you're breathing in through the left nostril, holding it for a brief moment, breathing out through the right nostril, holding it for a brief moment, and then breathing in through the right and out through the left. And all it does is basically, A, require your focused attention, and it is a very introspective breath. So if you're getting to that stage where you feel your focus has gone outside of yourself and perhaps in a direction that isn't um, useful to your outcome that you're looking to create, it's a really great recentering breath that actually has uh, its own mechanisms in the body that perhaps require a little bit more description than, um, than we'll go into today. So just, to, shall I run everyone through it yeah. practically? Yep. So the way that you do it is um, you actually bend over the index finger and the middle finger so that you have the little finger and the ring finger free and the thumb. And you're basically wanting to start to regulate the flow of the breath by half closing the nostril. So that in and of itself starts to introduce and interrupt the natural flow. So you can introduce a longer, more streamlined breath. And you breathe out by, so you might block the right nostril. You, you do it right where the crease of the nose is. So you block the right nostril with your thumb and you exhale through the left nostril and you just have it half open. So you're never like completely free with both, both nostrils. You exhale through the left nostril, inhale through the left, and then block the left, and exhale through the right. And then you do the same on both sides. And you do that for sort of 12 or so breath rounds. But I know when you were actually practicing that, say, I saw you do it a couple of times on PD, you might just do it for three or four breaths. And by that stage, it literally is just a, a reset button, basically. Yeah, it was a reset button. I used it, so you taught it to us right before we left, or when we got back there, one of the other. Yeah. And I think it was the day before we competed, I started to start to get you know, nervous. And as soon as I'd feel that, I would just do that breath technique. And like Jane said, there's a lot to it physiologically, but for me, mentally, because it's, you're all probably going, what do you do in, when, out? Yeah. It makes you think. And so it takes your mind off whatever it is that was making you nervous, and you've got to really think about it. So it's out with the left, in with the left, out with the right, in with the right. Yeah. You start with that out breath. So um, the day I competed, I thought like, I felt really quite good. But like walking around on PD the first day I competed, I think I was walking around the warm-up pen, and then I just start to feel a little like butterfly twinge in my stomach, which I have always felt before I show. I've never not had it there, but I would do that little breath technique, and it would just go away, and I was back to being uh, in that zen. that zen state. There's a book called Superman that. What's it called? Superman, the... No, Flow, the Rise of Superman, something like that. But it's about being in the flow state when you're competing or doing anything. And I'd say that's as close as I've ever got to the, the flow state. There was no... I was just in the moment. I wasn't worried about stuff. It was, it was, yeah, it was a very cool... Yeah. A very cool feeling. But um, just to flag up again, like, that's not the secret ingredient. It's just one 
technique that you can use once you've really got a solid foundation that you're launching from to kind of just bring you back. It's like a, it's a tweaking process. And I mean, perhaps this is a, a good story to throw in the mix. It's a little bit further back, but um, when I was doing my hypnotherapy qualification um, a couple of years back, I come in as a natural skeptic generally to everything that I do. So I'm not sold to instantly. I, I don't buy into processes immediately. I kind of want to experience them. And so as part of the training, we had to swap out. So one of us would be someone that was leading through um, the, the client or the person um, in a therapeutic context, and then we would swap. So when it came to my turn to be the, um, in the receiving chair as the client, um, I was like, okay, ready for this thing to happen to me, ready for something to change or some magic to come in from the outside and kind of change things up so that I would feel different. And I went through the entire process and really nothing happened. It was, I felt um, no change. I really didn't get into the process at all. And I went to the facilitator or the, the teacher afterwards and I said, you know, like I feel really bad. I, I sat there really, nothing happened. I didn't experience any didn't experience anything and she said well that's because you were actively not doing you were actively not doing the process and for me that was like a huge light bulb moment and something that I've shared in joyride loads because the thing is you can learn all of these techniques and and read about all these principles and you know watch videos on people doing the things that you perhaps should be doing or want to be doing in order to get the results that you want but it's a really it's a process of actively doing the techniques so that if you, if you become anxious, for instance, or you feel yourself getting off track, there, it's, a, it's a, a constant conversation that you're having with yourself, a constant process of engaging in active choices to focus on the positive or to decide to be a certain way and then to activate the things that support that. So, you know, when it comes to the, talking about the breath techniques or things that we do in the moment, say, as soon as the warm-up or as late as the warm-up, those things work because there is an active participation that's come a long way before that of choosing to operate in this framework. And then it becomes easy because that choice has been activated so many times, it's like your default mechanism that you fall into. But until that time it's even like you can't really afford to get complacent because it's you know generally it's not socially or environmentally supported to be positive or to be to have a, a positive outlook it's very easy to create camaraderie in negativity or camaraderie in things that aren't going well and you'll notice if you really start to audit yourself in terms of your conversation in terms of what it is that you talk about or read about, how easy, how wired we are to actually engage in negative talk or conversation. Well, there was um, a post a few minutes ago, someone said, well, isn't that whole negative self-talk just human nature? Yeah. Uh, yes and no. You know, I think that um, if, think we, if we talk about it in a really global context, like that my take on it is that we are hardwired for survival. So up until this point, evolutionary we're quite young on the planet you know if you want to get into this sort of side of things and I think we are hardwired like anxiety ha serves a purpose there's a reason that you know we're able to survive up until this point but now we're in we're in a place where we can actually step into a creative context as opposed to a survival context right. we're not in danger of dying yeah we're not in danger of dying so it's like how do we actually take it to that place and that becomes something that is really a trained process I think and, and kind of a conditioned process I guess rather than trained a conditioned mm -hmm. process to to move in that direction and to focus on the positive and to seek those outcomes yeah and I think it's I think it's important that you guys understand that the, the work whatever work it is whether it's training a horse or you know doing what Jane's talking about you do a lot of it and you don't think you're getting anywhere. Think about, think about if you want to get a six pack. You know, you start going to the gym and get working on your six pack. You don't go home the first day and go, it's not working. But Some of us do. But it's, but it's human nature to do that with, with anything. Yeah. And so there's a book that I've read. It's a very short book by a fellow named George Leonard and it's called Mastery. Here's one I prepared earlier. It's called Mastery. And in this book of mastery, he talks about the plateau. I'm going to show you a little diagram right here. 
So you can see that little diagram looks like some steps. Let's show this camera here. I've got three cameras down here. So he talks about the plateau and he said, usually when you're learning something that you, when you first start, you'll have an upward surge. When you get a new skill, you have an upward surge and then you'll drop back down a bit and then you're on a plateau. So I'll show you again. So you see that at the beginning, there's a little upward surge and then you're on a plateau. So where's the beginnings on this side here? So you go along and then there's an upward surge and then you drop back down. I'll show you guys. Along, up, and then you drop back down. So what tends to happen, what he explains in his book tends to happen is, you go along then you have an upward surge and then you drop down and then you're on a plateau and you, what you're doing when you're on that plateau is you are developing the skills you're gonna need to have the next upward surge. But what tends to happen is we have an upward surge, then we drop down a little bit and then we flatten out and right there we go, this stuff's not working. Mm. I'm, 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 I'm stuck, it's, it, I'm not getting any better. I got better and now I'm getting worse. And you're not getting worse, what you're actually doing is you're practicing the skills you're gonna need to have your next upward surge. And in there he talks about loving the plateau. He says you, you have to understand that you will spend most of your time on the plateau. So you need to learn to love the plateau. You have to embrace the plateau, you have to, one of the things he says, you have to practice for practice sake, not for um, getting further ahead. And, he, and in there he references one of the um, most spiritual, the ancient Hindu practices, which is called karma yoga. And karma yoga is applying yourself to a task with no thought as to the outcome of that task, which is what you are doing when you're on the plateau. You are just doing the work. You're not doing the work with an expectation it's gonna get you something, you just do the work. And I know personally with the the, uh, the work that I've done this year on myself with, say, the therapy. I went to a therapist for six months before uh, I felt a difference in anything. You know, and all of a sudden, whoa! It was quite different. And it, and it kind of came upon me in a, as a surprise because I was, I, I, I don't think I was thinking this is not working because um, I understand that, I understand the plateau. You know, it's in horse training, it's in, in everything. But it was probably six months and I didn't think it wasn't working, but I was thinking, yeah, it's a slow process, you know. But all of a sudden, whoa, I had this big upward surge and it was quite, uh, it was quite a good feeling because it was, you know, it's like all, the, all this hard work has made a difference. And I think, you know, you've, you've, you've got to understand that when you're learning something like that, you'll be spending a lot of time doing the same thing over and over and over and you think you're not getting anywhere, whether it's trying to get a six pack or you're trying to do all this, inner work like with the therapy or like what you have people do, Jane. I mean, and it's the same thing with, with, with my business, helping people with their horses. I have so many people go, he got better, but now he seems to be getting worse. That's perfectly normal and you have to learn to embrace that. You have to, I think that's the biggest thing I'd love, that's the gift I'd love to be able to give people. If they just understand that that plateau is perfectly normal, everybody goes through it mm -hmm. and it's, you're not failing. <laughs> if you're on the plateau, you are not failing. You are actually succeeding. You are in, you are on the path for success until yeah. you have your next upward surge and then you drop back down yeah. and you go again. I had a um, conversation with a friend recently and she wrote a really great thing for me where um, we were talking about uh, one of my horse's progress and I said, oh, it feels a little bit like Groundhog Day. And then we had this moment where everything went to a, the next stage and I posted about it on Facebook and she sent me a message and said, see, while you were busy doing nothing, you were busy doing everything. And it's the same. That's exactly, exactly it. the thing. Yeah. yeah. And I keep quoting that because it's like, it's so true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's a great way of explaining that whole, you need to practice for practice sake and yeah. not for the, and not for the, the, the thing you're going to get, get out of it. Yeah. Yeah. And it's micro successes as well. Like once you experience that, you know, once you're able to break things down into a really, uh, yeah, to experience the process and enjoy the process, you, there is a elation that comes with the very small successes within In those moments, you know, like it, you reframe what success actually right, looks exactly. like. Right, exactly. So that, that plateau seems to be flat, but there's a lot of little successes in there. And if you were only thinking about the big, plat the big upward surge at the end, you don't see them. Yeah. Whereas if, I think if you're, really present, you, you notice, notice those successes. And I know in horse training, a lot of times those successes aren't actually what you want. 
Yeah. What those successes are is the horse trying a different answer. Like it's not the right answer, it's a different one, which is good. If I can get my horse to try enough different answers, he will eventually find the right answer. And yeah. so, um, so over behind the camera right now is, is Becca Tate. She's from Texas and she's staying with us. And I gave her, when we went away to WEG for two weeks, I gave Becca a job. She bought a horse with her and he's a half Frisian, half white Asian? He's a mutt. He's a mutt. Okay, he's half Frisian, half something else. But he's a registered half Frisian. He's a great big buckskin horse. He's beautiful. Um, and I gave Becca some work to do while I was gone. And I've been back for a couple of days and helping her with that. And the first day I got back, he was kind of asking all kinds of different questions, which is fine. He's not getting it right, but he's looking for the answer and we kept rewarding the one answer that was right. And then today we went out and instead of looking in all these different places, he was looking more like, okay, the answer's more here. And so now we're kind of just shaping, shaping that behavior into a more of a minute correct answer. Mm -hmm. But I really think, I don't know with, with what you do with people, but mm -hmm. with horses, if people could reframe their way of thinking that when the horse is not getting it right, as long as he's not getting it right a different way than he was before, that's good because he's he's searching out yeah. the answers and you have to look at that as success. Like, okay, he's doing something wrong different. Yeah. Something that's not correct differently, which means he's looking for answers. And I think that's the, probably the, the biggest struggle, one of the biggest struggles people have is embracing that. Instead of having that defeatist attitude, like he's not getting it right, it's mm. like, hey, he's not getting it right, but he's not getting it right in a different way than he yeah. was before, which means that eventually we're going to yeah. get there. Look, look, it's look, just, look, things it's are just, happening. Yeah, it's just shaping things. Yeah, yeah, very cool. I think for, for me and what I teach, it's um, the goals are only there to illuminate the process. So you, I love you that. create yeah. the vision, you create the goal, and then you divorce yourself from it as soon as it's illuminated the process. And that's really like, I see it as kind of like casting your positive line of tension out into the future. You create a little GPS marker at somewhere down the line and that's what allows you to, to kind of create the next step. And it might be that when you take the next step, you decide that actually you want to go in a different direction and that's fine because that's completely within your power. Right. You know, but it's when we have these fixed goals and fixed expectations somewhere down the line that really immobilizes us and sometimes overwhelms us because we, ha we, we feel like there's this huge chasm between where it is we are now and where it is that we need to be or want to be or should be, all of those things, and forget that in between those steps a whole lot of stuff happens um, that kind of would answer those questions if we would just let it. <laughs> yeah, I really think, you know, I've talked about this before in different forums, but this whole horse training Thing, trying to you know achieve goals with your horse is really just a you know it's your personal development journey and whatever your goal is is just the it's just the thing that draws you along on the journey it's not it's, it's not the thing you have to actually attain because it's what you learn along the way and it's the I think once you start to embrace the journey which means you're starting to enjoy the plateau you got to learn to love the plateau as the book says mm. um, I think it really takes the frustration out of stuff because you know you're supposed to be wherever you're at, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And the goals in and of themselves, generally, I found from personal experience, I won't talk for you or anyone else, but they become so much more intangible. So as opposed to like doing this thing or going to that place or that competition, it's very much about the feeling or the relationship or the connection. And when there is evidence of that progressing, then that is really success. So for those of you that would follow your plan, for instance, and maybe do the focus work and, you know, like licking and chewing, being able to establish a sense of relaxation in your horse can be like winning a gold medal. <laughs> if it's, you know, and that's the engagement in the process. It's like there's so much satisfaction that actually creates its own self-propulsion once you realise what it is you're intrinsically searching for that actually the manifestation of that becomes or can become so much different to what you initially anticipated it might look like. Yeah, and, and the other thing too, thinking about like that focus work that I now, I'm now doing, um, I, it, I'm doing the same, I'm, I'm trying to achieve the same thing I have always tried to achieve, but I've just, you know, they, they say that, you know, the journey's not a straight line, it's, it's circular and you, you keep coming back to, to see deeper truths in what you've 
thought you knew the truth of, and, and you cannot, you can't see the next deeper truth till you get there. And so, yeah, um, yeah it's, it's, it's not, it not, doesn't go straight ahead. It, it circles back around, and I think you just see more stuff in the same things uh, you saw before. And once, and I guess, you know, it's just a paradigm shift. Once you get that, there, yeah. and you understand that, and you've seen it a few times to know that, you know what, there is no end and there is no right answer. Today, who was I talking to, was it you? No, it was, it was Becca. Uh, we were talking in the truck, we went and dropped some stuff off this morning, we were talking in the truck and Becca said, now that I'm, why well, you show me a way to do it right or whatever, and I said, Becca, there is no right, there is no wrong, really, you know, it's, it's intangible because what seems right now, mm. when we make that next circle around and come back and see it from a different set of, a different viewpoint, mm. it'll be like, okay, there's probably a better way to do it. But yeah. And that's, I talked before about judgment and the whole self-judgment thing, and I think I used to be really quite judgmental about what other people were doing with their horses, and, and it wasn't until I realized, I learned to be not so judgmental on myself that I wasn't, I, I realize now that everybody's at their own place in their own journey, mm -hmm. and that's, that's where they're at, you know, like, yeah. You can't be somewhere where, you, where, you're, where you're not. And so I think everybody, um, you know, everybody's doing the best they can with, with the information and the experience they've had. Totally. And it always comes back to what you can control and influence anyway, which is only ever yourself. So it's like if you want to do something different, you do that. <laughs> you know, you be the marker for what you want to represent as opposed to kind of denigrating this side of things. Right, yeah. I'm, uh, Is that what uh, you were talking about? Yeah, and it's, you know, I see people on, in social media especially horse professionals, who were promoting stuff saying it's wrong. And I, you know, I always like to say, you know, promote what you love instead of bashing what you hate. Because yeah. just putting that negative energy into anything is just, I don't know, it's taking away time from things. You, if, if, if you really believe what you do is right, hey, spend your time yeah, putting, your energy, putting, behind putting that. energy behind that, having yeah. people be aware of it, not, not telling somebody else they're, they're doing it incorrectly because, like I said before, um, we're all in different places. And yeah, I really, I really don't like that whole making a well, right and wrong. Pointing that out never is really a good platform for creating a dialogue. It just creates defensiveness anyway. So right. it's like it's the chances of actually affecting change in that particular situation are so limited. That it's, um, yeah, I, I, you know, know, a lot of people that follow my stuff may keep their horse at a, a place where, you know, in America they call them a boarding facility. In Australia it would be an adjustment place. Is it an adjustment in New Zealand? It is, yes. Yeah. yeah. Basically where you pay to keep your horse somewhere. Um, and there's, so there's a lot of different horse people there and there's a lot of different viewpoints there. And they say, how do I, someone there's doing it wrong. How do I tell them that they're doing it wrong? I said, you, you don't. I saw a, a thing in a... I think it was in a Western store a while ago, and, it, and it's, it was a sign to hang on the wall, and it said, the best sermons are lived, not preached. And yeah. I really think that's a good way of looking at it. Just do what you do, and if you do it well enough, those people will start asking you, hey, how did you do that? And then you can, then you can, can sermon them all you like. Yeah, yeah. Um, then you can preach all you like if you have a receptive audience. But I really think that trying to preach to someone who's not open to it, Yeah makes them less open to it than they would have been if you hadn't said anything. Yeah. And plus, it's, all, it's costing you something. Like, you can only focus on one thing at a time. So the way that I think about it is if I'm choosing to focus my attention on something that I disagree with or doesn't serve me in some way, it's at the, at the expense of me focusing on what it is that I do want to be promoting or investing in. So it's like, what's that equate? How's that equation going to roll? You know, it's a, it's a choice. It's an active choice to participate in one or the other. Mm. Yeah. And I really think that's that's the secret to everything really is that just that whole mental reframing of stuff. You know, that's that's been my whole year has been uh, all about that, both with the like the therapy I've been doing and with Jane's input. So something else Jane did for us, and you'll have to tell me what it's called. But Jane the audio thing. Oh yeah, so yeah. So um, Jane asked us a series of questions both Robin and I separately, because we have different things we want to work on, a series of questions this year, and then gave us an audio file to listen to based on our answers to those series of questions. And we have to listen to it with uh, stereo headphones, so I've got some noise cancelling headphones I put on. And initially I have Jane in both ears <laughs> saying the same thing. And then about, <laughs> it's about 35 minutes long, but about 10 minutes in, 
it changes to where she, I've got two Janes, one in each ear, and they're both Who saying. Who would have thought? <laughs> they're both saying different things, and um, I don't know that the I don't know the the technicalities behind it. I suppose it's got something to do with subconscious. I'm guessing. Yeah. Um, yeah. But that was one of the one of the many things we did this year, and and can I tell you it worked? No. Can I tell you I had the best show I've ever had? Good enough for me. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, maybe you can explain what that thing is, and, and it's part of your. Is it part of your? It's a different. It's a different thing that I do separate for Joyride, but it's what's it available. Um, it's a bespoke hypnosis audio. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I think the approach always has to be twofold. So a lot of all of our really habits, behaviours, and patterns that we initiate come from unconscious programming, you know, from subconscious programming. And so with any mental training practice, you need to be addressing, okay, well, how is it that I'm going to make these choices and make it easier for myself? So predominantly I'm set up for success so that making the active best choice is something that is um, available to me. But at the same time, how am I going to go about reprogramming everything that's happening on a subconscious or an unconscious level so that that so everything's congruent you know everything's in alignment and these are those the, the unconscious drivers are really the the patterns or the outcomes which leave you sitting in the saddle or before you even get there and thinking i know that there's no reason for me to feel this way but i just can't help feeling this way when that happens, that's really an unconscious or a subconscious program that we're running that's, that's pushing forward to the front. And um, it's especially common with injury or returning from some kind of like uh, trauma where the emotional trigger is very strong. So that defensive trigger comes to the forefront of our conscious mind and it's not something that we can override. But with optimization as well. So visualization practices are an example of subconscious reprogramming. And essentially, if you want to create a future outcome that's divorced from past experience, that's where you want to start to get into some of these um, unconscious practices also. So visualization is a really great one. Um, unconscious, uh, unconscious visualization. Uh, guided visualizations are really great as well. But one of the things that I gave these guys was a, um, a guided hypnosis audio. Now, the reason that it splits off into two different ears or two different narratives is because the left ear is involving itself or the narrative there is involving itself in the suggestions that we put together. So I asked, what is it that you would ultimately like to be feeling when you go out and compete? What is it that you would want to believe about yourself and what is it that you would want to experience? And then we put together a little paragraph that essentially encapsulates that in a tight little package. The other side of it is that we're really hardwired as human beings for stories. That's just the way that we communicate and the way that we've kind of evolved. We, we do well with metaphors and with narratives. So the, the, other, the other side of the program guides you through a narrative and um, at one point they come together so that you have the suggestions going in one ear and the narrative going in the other ear. So the reason for that is that um, our conscious mind, basically we're, we're only able to integrate so much information at any one time. And our unconscious mind is receiving so much information via the sensory system. That's how we receive all of our information. So what you see, what you hear, what you feel, what you smell, taste, all of this information is being logged in our unconscious mind. And it's actually baffling how much we take in at any one time. It's like millions of pieces of information per second. Now, obviously, that's unable to be filtered through to our conscious awareness without us going completely bonkers. So we choose six or seven pieces of information at any one time to draw from that pool to uh, bring into our conscious awareness. So your belief systems are, are really, if you think of it very literally, like a filter system between your unconscious mind and your conscious mind. And we're always wanting to be congruent with our experience. So what I mean by that is we always want to prove ourselves right. If I say, I'm not very good at this, then I will draw on all the different pieces of information from my environment that prove to me and to everyone else I'm trying to convince that I'm not good at this thing. So you have to realize that the conscious mind is kind of like a boxer size gatekeeper. It's like deflecting all the good stuff and just drawing in all the information that supports what it is that we believe about ourselves. The story 
that I give that's kind of very generic and a little bit lame, but is generally one that we all relate to, is that we all have a friend that thinks they're a little bit overweight and they're actually not. And they'll be like, oh, how do I look in this? And you're like, oh, you look great. And they're like, no, can you see this tiny bit of skin here that I'm pulling up? And, and that's because their belief system is that they are overweight and they draw in all the information and deflect any other information that's coming at them that tells them otherwise. So if I was just to make an audio or to sit here and tell you, you know what, Warwick, you're going to get out there at the World Equestrian Games and you're going to be amazing and, everyone, and you're going to get the best score ever and you know, you're going to have it together and it's going to be a smooth run. If you really didn't believe that, you'd be sitting there going, oh, that's really nice. Like, I think you're a really nice person, but it's bullshit. Like, you haven't seen me ride enough. You don't really know who I am. You don't, you know, all of these sorts of negative criticisms that we have about ourselves that align us with belief systems that don't necessarily serve us. And it works in the other direction as well. So basically, with the audios, what you're wanting to do is distract that little voice. You want to distract that that gatekeeper at the edge of your comfort zone so that we can slip under the radar and get all those nice thoughts in there that your unconscious mind absorbs. Because your unconscious mind has no filter. It just takes in whatever you tell it. So if you can get in there with the good stuff and distract your conscious mind enough, then you'll integrate and absorb that good stuff. So that narrative, the way that it splits is designed to do that essentially. It's like you might have experienced this, you're like, I'm going to listen to this one, then I'm going to listen to this one, and then I'm going to listen to this one, and you can't you actually can't, yeah, you can't keep track with both, and so that's where it becomes really effective. So if you were looking for a succinct description as to why that audio <laughs> might work, you didn't get it, but that's essentially what it's about. Uh, no, um, just listening, I've never really heard you explain it quite like that before, and I'm, yeah. thinking, I'm thinking that may have one of the, been the big parts of the success, because... Yeah, in the past, I think I've had that kind of depletion. Yeah, you know, we like all do. Yeah, like, we uh, do. you know, yeah, you're saying, uh, yeah, I, you know, I'm not that, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so it's, um, it's a, there's a method to the madness. Mm. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm pretty sure that listening to that, it's like, okay, because that was not there. Yeah. I think that's there, like, when I've competed before, that's been there. I'm like, I'm going to do good. No, I'm not. This yeah. is not going to work. Yeah, I'm going to do good. And yeah, it's almost like I've had a, a wrestle with myself. Yeah. Um, whereas there, was n there wasn't any, I didn't have that, I didn't have, there was no narrative going back and forth in my head. Yeah. Um, it was, it was congruent, it was like everything was just like where it was supposed to be. So that's, that probably was another one of the, the, the many things that, yeah, that helped. Yeah. You know, and once again, that comes back to that. And, and I think also the whole, learning not to judge, like that self-judgment thing, would have had a lot to do with that too, because, you know, that's that, what do you call it, the ISP? No? The itty bitty shitty committee. I <laughs> the little voice inside your the mind. The IBSC, like the itty bitty shitty committee, yeah. Yeah, yeah, we all, all have, have that, that as well. Yeah, yeah and, I, and when, I was at, when I was at the World Equestrian Games, I didn't have the IBSC, which I'm probably pretty sure I've never not had. Yeah. Uh, at any competition, let alone that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a big, a big part. That's something that most people highlight as the thing. You know, like the inner, the critical inner voice is like really strong in lots of people. And if you haven't learnt to a recognize it, b be able to differentiate between uh, back up. Yes, it's not until therapy this year that I learned to recognize it. Yeah. I, I didn't even, I don't think I even knew I had it. Yeah. Now I can look back and go, yeah, I had it. But I think at the time I didn't even know I had it. And so I was like, come on, I want to do better. And, you, and you're kind of beating yourself up, like beating your head against the wall, trying to be better. But if you don't recognize that that's there, yeah, then it's just a lot, you know, you're kind of paddling upstream and it doesn't matter how hard you try, you're not getting anywhere. Yeah. And the recognition or like the mindfulness is actually a really advanced stage. Like people, you know, I get a lot of people say, oh, I'm aware of it, but then I don't know what to do. And it's like, well, if you're aware of it, you're ahead of like 95% of the population because the awareness of that narrative is the very first stage, that mindfulness is the very first stage. And then what happens is there's a distance. As soon as you recognize that you have the itty bitty shitty committee, 
it's no longer intrinsically you. Like mm. you, there, it's a there's a distance, and then you can do something with that. So that's when the tools and techniques all come into play because you can start to manipulate and flick people off the edge of the world, like you do, or mm. press the delete button. Uh, I've done a lot of uh, something else. I've done a lot of this year, which was part of the therapy, and also something I was doing on my own is meditation. And initially, I uh, I couldn't like close my eyes and just focus on my breathing for like two breaths before I was off somewhere else. And one of the things they talk about in like meditating is when you notice that you're, if you notice that you're not present, you're present. You know, when you notice that you're no longer yeah. thinking where, what you're supposed to be thinking about, you're not doing it wrong, you're doing it right. Yeah. Sort of thing. And it's been, it's, it's been aware of that, but the, I think the meditation has helped me a great deal. And I realized, I realized I've never really sat still before like sat still and done nothing yeah I've, and, and i think that's part of the way i was raised is you know you're supposed to be doing something all the time you know when you know um you know that i've i've listened to a lot of brene brown stuff and she talks about numbing and you know numbing is you could be a workaholic you know workaholics are avoiding yeah stuff and yeah i, I have not i know i have not ever been able to to sit still and now it's getting it's so much distraction yes it's all distraction and it's all about being able to control your mind you know instead of having your mind control you and mm -hmm. that's that's probably the hardest thing i've ever done yeah and the, also the realization that i think is really important to share is that because i see this a lot when people first join my group is that oh i thought i was the only one <laughs> that felt like this, like these are human conditions, you know, this is like what we all have to one extent or another as similar yes. things. And, and no matter what, yeah. I'd say no matter what you're thinking, you're not the only one, whether it's that or something else. Yeah. Um, something I was talking to someone about recently, I forget who it was, but it's kind of someone in my position that there's a certain number of people who think I know what the hell I'm talking about. And whoever I was talking to said, well, what, you know, it's, I think they call it imposter syndrome. Yeah. Like, what if they find out? I really don't know what I'm talking about, which I, you know, I kind of feel that all the time, but it doesn't matter how far up the ladder you go, everybody you meet who's the, the biggest in their field has that feeling. Jane shared something with me the other day about uh, a fellow who was at a, a meeting yeah, or some like sort of a gathering conference, and a, a yeah. conference and it was full of all these people who achieve stuff like they were ceos of big companies well, that they invented, invented things something and whatever and, yeah. and this one guy was saying that um you know being around these people i kind of just felt like an imposter like i really hadn't done anything and, and what was the punchline how did it so he had the the guy whose post this was um and i'm sorry i can't attribute it because i'm not quite sure he was having a conversation with someone and they said oh i just feel like the you know, the little man in the moon with all the, all, in the room with all these little, the clever people that have invented things or worked things out. And it ended up being Neil Armstrong, like the first man on the moon. He was like, I just did what I was told. I, I went where they sent me. <laughs> and so for him, he was overwhelmed being in the room with all of these people who he perceived to have like, you know, a bigger claim to fame than he did in his mind. Well, and, he um, felt like he had no claim to yeah, fame and these people yeah. had actually done something with their lives, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so. It was pretty cool. And it was Neil Armstrong. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. New level, new devil, that's what I say. It's always, no matter what you step up to, you're always like elasticizing the edges of your comfort zone. And so as your comfort zone grows bigger, it might encompass what previously was uncomfortable, but now there's still a parameter to what exists outside that. You use a lot of big words, John. I do. I, I, I really, if I haven't. A stunned look on my face. It's because I'm like five words behind you when you're talking. I'm like, sorry, I was hoping <laughs> if I talked in front of you. I would love that. Like, talk a bit of Warwick. Right. So, you get to the edge of a fence. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. I like. Can you bring the old Jane back? Yeah, I'm back. I don't like yeah. Jane doing Warwick. Do we have any other questions here? I'm sure we do. Do you want me to open my laptop? Yeah. Why don't you open your laptop? I'd like to press see more, but if I do, we might I lose the yeah, screen. We'll I don't want to touch lose anything. That screen. Let me but just fire up. Yeah, Jane's going to fire up the laptop. But anyway, thank you guys for joining us. Um, I'm I'm really excited to share this stuff because it's 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 like a gift. Like if I could give somebody something, it's the it's that whole.
paradigm shift about the way you way you look at things, you know, like I don't know about that other page. We're on my group. Yeah. Page. page? Oh, okay. Like this book here, like I said, this one called Mastery by George Leonard. Um, when you read that book, you go, oh, it's not just me. And he talks about three different people. There's the dabbler, there's the obsessive, and there's uh, somebody else. But there's basically three main groups, subgroups that we all fall into in our attempts to do, uh, our attempts to do things. And when you're obsessive, the, the, uh, the dabbler and there's something else. But when you read that book, you go, oh, yeah. I'm like that too. So mm -hmm. what it helps you realise is you're not alone. Um, just like Jane was talking about a second ago, you're not alone. You are not the only one. Um, and it's kind of a human condition. All these, you know... It only... Is um, that an earthquake? Did our wall just crack right there? <laughs> we might have had a little shaker right there. Um, it only showed me the last five and they weren't... Mm. Yeah, they won't. Well, if you click on 53 comments, what does it do? I don't know. Yeah, I don't like these Facebook Live things. You, they, they, um... It's hard for us to see the comments, so yes. we might go back through afterwards and have a look. Or if you've got any questions that we haven't answered, post them again. Oh, we'll someone, I can't see who it was, but someone's just posted. So where does the shift... shift begin to start. Begin yeah. to start. Um... Val just tuned in while making cheese. Well, I hope it's good cheese. <laughs> Is How it? do you draw the fine line between keeping yourself safe and being confident? I am often confident but worry about whether I should be more careful. How do you draw the fine line between keeping yourself safe? I don't have a fine line there, really. I mean, I really subscribe to the need. They need to know the answer before you ask the question. So, um, I... Yeah, I don't really have to worry about the keeping safe because I'm basically, I'm very, very step by step in the stuff I do. I am as well. With, with, the, with the horses, I... Um, it's, it also depends what your definition of confidence is. Like, to me, confidence is the ability to stay resourceful and focus on what it is that I'm wanting to create. It's not synonymous with brashness or... It's not bravado. Yeah, bravado or kind of like pushing the line. That's not necessarily confidence. It's more, you know, the, the really in... The confident people have... <laughs> they don't sort of need to show a bravado, you know? It's like a... Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, what it's, it's, it's kind of like... So a friend of mine was a professional bull rider, okay? He's, he, made, he went to the PBR World Finals here in America 10 years in a row. And when I first met him and met some of those other boys, I thought they'd all be like these crazy guys. They are the most safety mm. aware people doing what they do. Mm. Like you'd think they would be all full of bravado, but they're not. They're confident mm. because they know what they need to do to stay safe, but they're not reckless. It's, yeah. it's, there's a yeah, huge difference the between being confident reckless. and reckless. And it's, I'm, you know, I know what I can control, what I can't control. I weigh up the, you know, I weigh up the odds, but um, yeah, it's, uh, I really think the, I've got that one. Oh, Steph, how did you guys go about managing your own expectations at WEG after you got a personal best in the first round and what's the rest of the Major question? consolation round. Uh, the, well, probably there was more pressure in the first round because you're, uh, you know, you're part of the team and you're competing for your country and it counts towards the team scores. We didn't actually expect to make the consolation round, so once we were there, <laughs> it was it was just gravy. It was like, um, let's just, like, there, there is no wrong answer, okay? That's where the bravado kind of comes in. <laughs> like, just go as fast as you can and try as hard as you can. And it's an everything-to-gain so scenario. Yeah, it's an everything-to-gain scenario. And... Um, but it, but it also wasn't, oh, I'm just going to run around here and it's probably going to fall to pieces, but I'm going to go as fast as I can anyway. It's like I felt really, really confident uh, in me and in Petey. And, uh, yeah, it was, it, was, it was the most amazing feeling. It was very, very cool because there was no, no pressure. Um, there was no pressure whatsoever. What do you think, Robin? Did you feel any pressure in that second round? No? Yeah, yeah it was... It was Fun. It was the most fun I've ever had showing a horse. It was really, really, really cool. They were the primary example of running your own race. 
yeah, no, it was, uh, it was very, very cool. And then, uh, so I went first out of the 20 people that went in the consolation round. So I went first. So I was leading there for a while. Actually, I was leading till Robin went in. And um, so she was the fifth one in. So then she beat me. Um, and so then Robin, we were first and second for a while. And then we, we had to stay in the top five. And probably over halfway through, we were still... Yeah. We were still... Um, Looking okay. like we might make the, well, we might make the finals. Oh, Steph says, how can you handle the pressure of the first round? Um, looking like we might make the finals. And then as it went on, it's like, okay, then I dropped off and Robin was still there and then and she dropped off. Robin was the next. So they took five to the finals and Robin was six and I think I was seven. And so Robin was half a point out of the finals and I was one point out of the finals. How to handle the pressure of the first round then? There wasn't any pressure. It was, like I said, it was the most relaxed I've ever been showing a horse um there was no pressure because pressure is just something you put on yourself and I, I and i really think all the work that i've done this year including the stuff james helped us with made all that go away and i we, I, I can't actually explain you know we've talked about it today but it i can't explain working, the one thing it was all working within a framework of completely what you could control and influence that really was like the whole framework that you went in on. You knew the, your horse really well. You knew the outcomes that you know that you were going for. You knew what needed to be happening within the context of the relationship between you both. And I just think that gave the aura of that. It was never like, oh, what's over there? Or it was very contained. Mm. Yeah, no, was, uh, the, the, I did not feel any pressure uh, whatsoever. And I've never actually felt that little pressure ever showing a horse, I don't think so. It was, it was, um... It's a practice though, isn't it? Like as well, for people oh. that do feel that, it's a practice. Yes. Like this is an ongoing practice. It was a, what is it now, the ninth month of the year? It's been nine months of... It's been nine months of work, really. Um, and, and like this year, so we bought a horse named Cooper for me to show this year, for me to get back in the show, and I hadn't shown in the last three years. And um, I spent all year sucking, pretty much. Oh, that's judgmental. Judgmental, shouldn't say that. I spent all year not being very good in the show pen, and I was quite happy. I was quite good with it because I think it got to the point where in the past, if I had been competing and not doing well, oh, what will they think of me? I, don't, I really didn't care what anybody else thought of me. It was all about just me pushing myself to see what would happen, and, and uh, I really didn't get shown very good uh, all year, so it was, you know, it was, a, it was a rough year as far as um, all the inner work I was doing. You know, that's hard work. Plus, going to shows and not doing well. But I didn't at any point in time go, oh, maybe it's not a good idea. It's like, hey, I know I have to slog through this. I have to, I have to get in there and, and uh, do this stuff. Zach has got a question. They're choices as well. Like it's an ongoing choice to feel. You know, you can, it's always, you have that option in the moment where you can decide to feel a certain way. You know, you can decide to respond to something that's happening and you can go one way or the other. There's always that moment where you might feel yourself go, oh, this is what I find personally anyway, where you find yourself, you could go into that negative direction or choose to take something from it that doesn't necessarily, you know, support you or make you feel good. And so there's an override button for a while until you train yourself to kind of look in that direction. You have to override that habitual feeling to go in a particular way and decide that this is the way that you're gonna go, mm. you know, in terms of maintaining your mindset. Just gonna press that button. Why don't you press that button? Excuse me, everyone. So, Ellie O'Brien, you just said you're feeling like this with equidays coming pressure. up. Feeling like what? Feeling the pressure? pressure. Because I, my advice for you, Ellie, is there. There really shouldn't be any pressure. If you were not qualified, Equidays wouldn't have contacted you. You know, they believe in you. So I think, um, I think you should believe in you. Another thing, it'll be fun. I'm telling you, it'll be fun because this. I have found that. Teaching or presenting in front of crowds is really, really good for you to learn your stuff. Like, it really helps you, um, oh, how to say, it's really helped me 
be able to explain what I'm saying. You know, you can almost judge by people's faces if you if they think that you're like full of crap, <laughs> basically. Um, no, I think I think you'll. Have, I would in, I would enjoy that. I would try to. I would try to um, enjoy the experience. I'd look forward to. Um, uh, you know, being able to share your experience and your knowledge with people from your home country. Um, and try not to think that you're being judged because you're not. I watched a, um, a TED talk a little while back and the lady was talking about how at the start of when she started presenting, because obviously it was something that she did for a living, she used to get really bad stage fright. And then she said, now I realise that your focus isn't on me, my focus is on you. And so while her focus was on imparting what it is that she wanted to teach... So she shifted it from thinking that their focus was on her to her focus being on them. And as soon as she shifted that, it, the spotlight went off her and onto what is it that I want to give them as right. opposed to what is it that they're getting from me. And when she made that tweak, then it's like, this is what I offer, this is what I have to offer. Yeah. And the other thing that I think you, I find really helpful just in terms of that and many of you that will be watching are kind of like professionals in something, you're kind of experts in some area, and you can get stuck on the fact that you need to be the best at something or you have to have like all of the answers. And the way that I approach it is that there are, there are so many people that are able to contribute to the conversation of horsemanship or psychology and all of these things, and we, if we can, we can operate from the platform that we are actually contributors, we're contributors to the conversation, we don't have to know all of the answers and we can be brave enough to say maybe we don't know the answer to, to that particular thing that someone said or this is my experience. Then you just become part of this big pool of knowledge that, and this is your part in offering that knowledge to those people out there. That's the way I see it. If you, if you can see yourself as a contributor as opposed to like the person that has to have all the answers, it takes the pressure off, I think. Oh, but I think there's something else to add to that too, Jane. When you can... If you are, you know, you're supposed to be the expert and you can actually get up there and be vulnerable and yeah. let people know that you don't know all the answers or whatever, there is something that happens, I don't even know what it is. It's called shared humanity. <laughs> is that what it's called? I think there's, so. there's something that happens yeah. in the air, in you the energy, the glass whatever. You. Yes, there's something, when you, you know, many of you would know that I'm a huge fan of. Brene Brown and, and you know she Who? says that Brene Brown and she says, says that that uh, shame is the scourge of society and that vulnerability is the antidote to shame and I think we think she's on to something <laughs> yeah I think she's on to something <laughs> but the, the thing that if you ever get the chance and so Ellie here you go you're going to get the chance Super if you get there. the chance to be vulnerable to a large crowd of people, it's good stuff. Something happens. Yeah. I don't know if it happens out there, it happens in here, but something happens. Yeah. And so, but you've got to be, I think, you know, she talks about it too, uh, that being authentic or vulnerable like that is the ultimate brave in, in uh, bravery. Yeah. I think I talked about this a little bit with you a while ago. Um, I start, Before I came away to the US, I started making this ritual with myself where I would uh, write a post every day, write something about whatever it is I was experiencing or feeling. And, um, and so as a result of that daily practice, you kind of, it takes you out of the usual cycle of commenting because I can be uh, commenting in sort of a very professional context on like mental skills and it can be very, da -da -da -da, you know, prescriptive. And because of the practice, I started to share more of my thoughts and feelings about what horsemanship meant to me, what my horse meant to me, you know, more of the personal side of things. And I noticed that as I started posting, I was getting more and more nervous with each post. And as the posts got more vulnerable, I would regularly shit my pants the more that I posted those posts. And so... What I noticed, however, was the, the posts that I thought, oh, people are going to think this is ridiculous or she's cracked and here we go, <laughs> Jane's finally lost it, were the posts that I got the most engagement with because it's actually what's inside all of us. And when you are the first person, not to say that I was the first person, but when you take the step of sharing something, it's like opening the floodgates 
and everyone realizes that they're not an island in an, a certain experience and that's where you really get the shared learning from from it so i would just you know i if in terms of that the context of ellie what ellie's talking about just lose the feeling that you need to operate within a certain framework and go in with what it is you're going to do and just be responsive to yourself and to to what's around you in terms of what you share and offer yeah yeah I, so cindy just said being vulnerable creates connection yes it does yeah. and i think that's a really good way to connect with an audience is to be vulnerable not but you've got to be authentically that way you can't just go in there and you yeah. know you're not a stand-up comedian so you, you it's not about that, but I think, um, and and I would also probably suggest that's not your that's not your platform. You're going to go in there and you're going to be an educator. Yeah. I don't know what I'm doing, but when something comes up that yeah allows you to be vulnerable, by all means, by all means, do it. I think really, especially when you're supposed to be the, you know, you're an, a, 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 an expert like that. You're supposed to be the expert. Um, every expert I've ever met are the first ones to admit they really don't have all the answers. Yeah. And there's also what I've noticed from observing Warwick and other horsemen that are at the top of their game, there's a mutual respect between all disciplines and all areas of training, like at the higher echelons. Yeah. You know, you think if you're involved in your local horse club, whatever, and you think, oh my God, this is so petty. Can you imagine what it's like at the top? It's the complete opposite. It, it goes away the further you go up. It doesn't get more petty. It gets, it's almost like the most petty people are the ones who are at the very, very yeah. bottom. And, and as you go further up, I think everybody, it's, it's kind of like when you look on the TV and you see some rock star hanging out with some sports star and you go, why does he get to hang out? Why do those cool guys get to hang out together? Because they both have... Uh, they both have an understanding of how much effort it takes to get to the top of anything, even if it's not their game. If I'm an entertainer and you're a sports star or whatever, I understand what you went through to get here. It's like a mutual admiration society. Yeah. And, and you know, like at the, uh, at the World of Question Games, go off there before I think. Fly guy. Um, one of the coolest things for me was after my first run, I came out the back gate and I got high-fived by... Uh, Brett Parbury, who's on the Australian dressage team. So he'd come over to watch. And there's a really, really cool picture some of you may have seen that was taken at the Games when Robin's got her score announced in the second round when she was at 220 and a half and she's going, yeah! And the picture's taken from the other end of the arena and in front of her in the stands is a sea of Australian team shirts all going, yeah! <laughs> One of them was the uh, chef de quip for the Australian show jumping team. One was the Australian high performance manager, the Australian team high performance manager. So, and we've never met these people in our lives before. One was, I think, the new CEO of um, Equestrian Australia. One of them was Miss Jane Pike here. Um, I was invested. <laughs> but yeah, it was very, very cool, the support we got from, I think one of them might have been Team Vet here. Um, but yeah, it was just very, very cool, the support we got from those guys. So yeah, it's amazing. Very cool, what else have we got? Uh, there was a the question that popped up a few minutes ago. I couldn't quite read Online it, but then, the, then I realised it was. Pages. Yeah, this I couldn't one? find the answer. Uh, no, it was online. Right, I think we've filtered it down, unfortunately. Do you want me to have a look at? Oh, hang on. Let's read this. Susan, I'm doing it tonight on stage. The only way I can sing on stage is singing from my heart and doing the moment. Susan, everything you do is from your heart in the moment. So I don't think you'll have a problem doing that. You're going to be awesome. Okay, should I have a look at those questions that were on your page from before? Can we have a look at the questions from before? Yeah. A lot of them had to do with... A lot of the questions had to do with the breathing technique. Uh, I can't see most of the stuff. But I'm sorry, guys. We almost need to have two laptops open here. I know. Let me just go to the group, maybe. Sorry, I'm just pulling up the questions that we had before from um, the post you put up yesterday. Just scanning through. I look like my father going like this. Oh, I can't <laughs> quite see. That was weird. I looked and it's like, where's Dad? Hey, Dad, how you going? <laughs> oh, God, it's me. 
All right, scanning down, scanning down. So someone just uh, came online and is watching, and we're talking about reframing stuff. And the, the person I'm talking about, I'm not going to say who it is, but the person I'm talking about, when I first met her a number of years ago, um, she, uh, you know, was having trouble with a horse, and it's been amazing. And I've have seen a lot of this, and I'm sure you have with what you do too, James. It's been amazing seeing the the whole. Once they started reframing how they thought about their horse and doing different things with their horse, it's amazing to see how they've reframed the way they look at everything. And there's been some really cool, uh, for me, just watching people, you know, for four or five years go from, you know, the, oh, my horse, uh, my, you know, my horse won't, my horse won't, and having them reframe how they think about that, but then it carries over into every part of their life. And there's been some amazing um, transformations you might say as far as how people uh, you know how they handle stuff in their life it's been amazing yeah what do you got there okay so Kathy um, so Kathy posted in the group yesterday asking um, were the strategies Jane used to help you both at WEG the same for both of you or did they differ because of a difference in mindset experience perception between you and Robin um, shall I answer that? Well, I can't answer for Robin, so you know, the, you know the both of I do, so... Yeah, so I think it's all... Sort of not long... I'm trying to succinctly answer this without rambling on for half an hour. But, um, so basically there's a framework, there's a course that I teach called Competition Ready, which provides me with a framework, basically, of approach for how it is that we want to get your head in the right space for competition. And the, the main elements of that are training your focus, so really getting your competition mindset and identity in the right space where you believe that you are a worthy part of what it is that you are going to engage in. And that's really important for something like WEG where, you know, the perception could be, oh my goodness, it's sort of like, you know, it's up there, it's one of the big international competitions and you can... It would be easy to default to that feeling that you weren't worthy or you know big enough to kind of be there and so you really have to to get your head in the right space to understand that your competition mindset needs to match the experience and that's really one of the first first things you get into we did both together uh creating what i call performance statements which is a piece of um consciously designed self-talk that's how i describe it so that when you feel your internal conversation revert to a narrative that isn't particularly supportive or is critical or upsetting or some way disturbs you, you've already designed something that you can slot into place. If you think of it like a slideshow, you know, and the wrong slide comes across and we take that one out and we put the one in that we want. A lot of the work that we do involves um, making sure that you're not left to make a decision in the moment when the environment isn't necessarily supportive of what it is you're trying to create. So you really don't want to leave decisions or last minute things to pressurise situations. So that's where we deal with everything before. We, we get mindsets in the right place. We look at the self-talk angle with, you know, the audios these guys did. Um, it's definitely individually dependent because we all have our own stuff like you know there'll be things for work that weren't necessarily on Robin's radar and vice versa and it's the same for all of us so while there might be a process that is followed just like stick to the damn plan within that there's a little bit of individual specification for each horse right, or yeah, each rider for each rider yeah, yeah I yeah. know I you know you asked Jane asked us certain questions like what are some of the the whole performance statement you yeah, do, you know, yeah. ask questions and you have to answer it. And of course, my answers weren't the same um, as Robin's. Yeah, so there's specification within the format, I guess, and, and none of it's a format as such. But there's a, you know, if you if you want to create a process, then there's a need for some kind of like framework, I guess. So yeah. Hey everybody, the famous the Matt Mills is watching. We have a we have a, a World Equestrian Games. Gold medalist. Oh, Matt says my shirt is on point. Why, well, thank you, Matt. <laughs> so cool. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if that answered the question, but there was individual specification. I guess that's the, that's the answer. Um, uh, 
And this one here would be a really good one for you. So for a person lacking confidence like myself, how can they create positive and strong energy inside themselves which their horse can sense and believes them when they ask for something, i.e. staying out of personal space? Hope that's not a stupid question. No, it's an amazing question. Um, it doesn't have a short answer, <laughs> but I'll try, to, I'll try to answer it. So I think part of that congruency between unconscious drivers that I talked about earlier and conscious behaviour is the need to align those two things. And that alignment comes with having a really clear intention about what it is you're looking to create and, and have that be congruent with how it is that you're feeling, right? So that if you're actually thinking, okay, I need my horse to move out of my space like Pam's highlight, and you're actually thinking, shit, is he gonna hurt me? Sorry for the swear word. Um, goodness, is he gonna hurt me? Then you, your, your signals are mixed. And so part of the process, I guess, that we go through, just like the stick to the damn plan with the horses, is actually sticking to the damn plan for humans, where you're seeking to create that alignment, where the thought and feeling are in alignment with each other. Yeah, and so as a result of that, your action isn't sending mixed messages. You um, know, from the horse training side of it, horses are amazing at reading incongruency, and I'd say that's probably one of the hardest things people, for people, you know, just starting out on this whole journey to learn is that you you kind of have to believe in what you're asking. You know, you, yeah. you, you can't be putting on a brave front and feeling worried inside because horses can read through that. And I really think one of the big skills that you learn, learning to be around horses, is learning how to control your emotional state. Yeah. Yeah. That's probably the one of the one of the biggest things is yeah getting your you know your insides and your outsides in alignment because yeah. horses are in, and see for me that's been a bit of a, a mind a mind blower or eye opener over the years i thought i was a horse trainer and if you do this particular thing it'll work it does if everything in you lines up but if everything in you does not line up the technique itself doesn't work yeah. near as well and it's and so it's now I'm kind of venturing off into the territory of teaching people how to you know like nowhere near what Jane does but you know it's, it's I've realized it's not so much just about how you ask the horse to do things but whether you actually are you know congruent stuff I mean one of the big things I see I have seen over the years a lot of people do is asking a horse to move while leaning backwards so they lean back, get away from me, and they lean backwards. And the horse goes, you know, they, they, they're just two opposing things. Stepping away from them while asking to get off you just sends a really, really mixed message. And, mm -hmm. and I, I don't know if there's a, a, a quick answer for it. but It's basically everything I teach comes down to that particular mm -hmm. thing. Like congruency between thought, feeling, and emotion, and being able to, to carry that with you when you're with your horse. That's really the ultimate art of self-control, isn't it? Like emotional control, to be able to decide how you want things to be and to be able to act in accordance with that um, while being responsive. You know, that's the art of horsemanship as well. You know, you're responding to, to what's in front of you in a way that you adapt to what's needed. Mm. And um, that's why I can't answer that in the short time. <laughs> that's a book. Yeah, it is a book. Um, you know, the other thing, along those lines too about controlling your emotions is there's times with horses that you have to firm up yeah you know you have to do something you have to do it right now in being able to do that and then go back to flat line right afterwards is a is a skill a lot of people have trouble with they they either can't be firm enough or when if they have to get firm there's a there's an element of anger attached to it and there's no reason to be angry but most people cannot be firm and firm up with the horse without having a you know a bit of that attached to it and it comes across with that and I think learning how to be firm while still staying in the same emotional state you're in before you got firm is a, a very a difficult one for people to do too and I think management you know it's, it's kind of like being a good manager would be the same thing too you know Having to fire someone without being mad at them or, you know. As well, and instead of sort of thinking about it as like 
changes in terms of like a chapter of a book. It's actually like turning up the volume on a continuum. So it's that emotional agility to be able to be, you know, be a bit louder if needed and just as easily be able to drop back and then move in the other direction as needed. So it's like, you know, that, that flexibility emotionally to be able to, to change like that and not, and not to at the same time um, attribute meaning to what it is that's being presented mm -hmm. like with your horse. Yes. Yeah. So the, you're not taking it personally, it's just this is this and this is how I need to respond to that and we're not going to create a narrative around that that keeps us fixed. It's the story or the narrative that we attach to the behaviour that what makes us unable to move. Are you laughing at me? You no, I'm laughing because in my therapy, in my group therapy, one of the things they're talking about is just the facts. Yeah. Okay. Describe something that's just a fact. Like they'll, they'll sit in the room and they'll go, well, why don't you describe five things that are just a fact? Like, you know. That's an ugly saddle. No, you can't say that's an ugly saddle. That's a saddle. That's mm. a whatever. And, and it's just, they just do it in, in ways that aren't emotional. You know, like there's no reason to be emotional about things at the time, but they're trying to have you practice just the facts when nothing's going on. Yeah. You know, just the facts. So my horse, he's moving towards me, he's moving away from me. It's not, you're not adding a narrative to it, like he's doing it because, or... This means this, and he right. doesn't like me, and so I'm gonna respond in this way. Um, I guess uh, the, the, one of the cool things that I think about is that any emotional framework that we're operating from is a result of three main components. It's a result of your focus, it's a result of your self-talk, and it's a result of your physiology, so how you're physically responding to those two mental aspects and if you can really work to that framework and just look to um, influence one of those so look to influence your focus and change it from a negative context to a positive context if you can influence your self-talk so it changes from the narrative of the itty bitty shitty committee to one that is supportive of the, the what it is that you're trying to create and one of the best ways to do that is to ask yourself really good questions so what is it that I need to do right now or how is it that I need to move forward? Or what is the next thing that's required of me in this setting? All of those things maintain your resourcefulness and also motivate you to find a solution as opposed to being invested in the problem. And when you ask yourself low quality questions, you get low quality answers like, why is this happening? And then your mind goes, that same idea of wanting to prove yourself right. Well, I don't know, maybe you're not good enough or your horse is not, doesn't like you. And so you support whatever it is that you project. So if you're, if you're stuck, then just think of a really good question. You don't need to know the answer, but it will motivate you to seek the answer out. So if you can leave it in a good space, for instance, leave you and your horse in a good space and then ask someone that's available to you what you should do next, then that's progression, you know? A little bit off, off topic. Um, let's do... I was trying to listen to your big words and then read someone else's big words at the same time. It's just I like you, big worded person. Who is that? That's Lynn. Lynn, well done. Um, so, what we're going to talk about anxiety. You can talk about anxiety all you like. Or do we want to... I feel like you should talk. I feel like I should talk. Okay, I'll tell you guys a story. Um, James talking about um, incongruency, like when you're, you know, your mind and your, your what and your what? Uh, your thought, feeling and, and emotion, thought, feeling and action, projection. Aren't all in, a, in alignment. So before I went to the last World Equestrian Games, in two, so this is my second time, I went in 2010, it was in Lexington, Kentucky, and before I went there, yeah, I felt all right. I mean, we were borrowing horses and whatever, and I didn't do any of the mental work leading up to it, but I thought I felt all right. Probably three days before, when we got there, three days before I completed, I was walking along one day, and all of a sudden, <coughs> I was just dry heaving. And then it would go away. And I was walking, and hang on, what's that? And then I walked along, and maybe that afternoon it would happen again. And it happened leading, the days leading up to when I competed right there. And I, at the time, was like, wonder what the hell that was and then here it is eight years later and I was telling my therapist about it and she was saying wow that's how I shut down you are that you your body was in panic mode and you didn't even know and so that's that's a well you say that's a high level of incongruency yeah and 
So it was very, very interesting. I'm glad the whole WEG thing turned out because with all the work I've done this year, I didn't know if I was going to be better or worse. Mm. I didn't know if I was going to be, because uh, I'm more congruent now, so I didn't know if I was going to be really nervous and throwing up and knew why I was throwing up mm. or if I know it turned out to be the complete opposite. But um, I think it's about processing. Like lots of us are, you know, when you're confronted with something which doesn't, match up to what you want to experience or believe uh, and it's well let me put it in a different way all of the things that we're, we're talking about is not about embracing your false positivity you know right. it's not about like oh i feel great and actually you don't feel great it's not about that it's understanding that if you are in a pattern of behavior or experience or anything whether that be in a competitive context be that with your horse or be that completely away from riding that has really valuable information in there and for as long as you ignore any messages, it will continue to perpetuate, you know? So if you're in a, I think if we're unable, if we haven't learned healthy ways of taking information from experiences or from emotions and understanding how to apply them in a, in a way that serves us, we kind of pack them away and we just like, you know, we distract ourselves or we mm -hmm. move on to the next thing and we never really deal with it. And then that's where things, keep coming up because basically we haven't taken what we need to from them. That makes sense. That makes sense. Chewy is watching. Hey Chewy. Chewy. Well done. Great job Chewy in Las Vegas, Chewy. It. So Chewy, well we were in um well, we were at the World Equestrian Games. Chewy who used to work for me, he was uh, rocking it at a running show in Las Vegas. Good job Chewy. Whoop, whoop. <laughs> so awesome. Um so look at another question. Why not? Rhonda's off to work. Thanks Have for joining. Have a day. Um, I think we've answered that one. So we're going to answer that one from Irene. Is that the, is that where the link is? How to put your nerves to one side when you know your horse is good, the groundwork's good. No human nerves present, but when it comes to throwing your leg over, the nerves begin. How to help yourself to help the horse? Um, that's probably more of a Miss Jane one for me, <laughs> but I'll give you my thing on that. Um, what I would suggest with, and this is probably going to be completely different what Jane would tell you, but from my experience with horses and humans is you need to recognise the place. So, like... A, Irene, it sounded like you went from, it's all perfect to I'm scared to death. Mm. There is some place where it goes from all perfect to I'm a little concerned. I think for me, that's the place I would want to work on there. There's no use waiting till you're out of your depth. And if anybody's watched my video and the story of how I jumped out of a plane this year, that's something else I did this year, mm. um, of how I, jumped, how I managed to jump out of a plane. And I was probably as casual jumping out of the plane as I was showing at the World of Question Games. <laughs> um, Which is pretty casual. <laughs> which was pretty casual and um, you know there's been a lot of steps leading up to jumping out of that plane from the first time I got on a plane in Australia 20 oh, when I was 23 I'm now 51 so you do the math there um, there's been a lot of small steps and it w if I had to try to jump out of a plane so when I first left Australia tw when I was 23 I'm in the plane in Sydney and it takes off and I'm looking out the window and the ground is getting further away and the houses are getting smaller. Any little wiggle in that plane, I'm like, <laughs> okay? If the next day you ask me to jump out of a plane, there's no way I could have done it, okay? But I've been on lots of plane rides since then. I have been in some helicopters since then. I've been in a helicopter with the doors off, so I'm sitting here looking out an open door. I've done that several times and so there's been a lot of things that have kind of expanded my comfort zone and then last year the big one was I, last year, year before maybe, I jumped off the stratosphere in Las Vegas which is 800 and something feet high and you, 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 you jump off the edge of it and so after that jumping out of the plane was quite easy but there was a lot of little steps to doing it and so for me personally I would suggest when you, you've got to get that first step outside your comfort zone to be your comfort zone. And then the next step is only the first step outside your comfort zone. I, I, I don't think if you, Irene, if you climb up on the manning block and you're scared to death and then you throw your leg over, you're just kind of overloading your boat, you're almost going to go into shutdown 
No, that's personally what I think. Mm. The other thing that um, seems relevant to this is Warwick talks a lot about rabbits. So, you know, the rabbit story with the accumulation of rabbits and by the time your horse has a reaction, there's already been a number of anxiety triggers that haven't been emptied out that results in the overflow. And for me, when I'm in a human context, the, the very first opportunity to introduce relaxation to a particular idea or experience comes with the thought. It comes with the thought of what it is that you want to do. So if you're doing groundwork out there with your horse and you're feeling really good, and then you go inside and you think, oh, maybe I'll jump on him on the weekend, and you think, and then you don't do anything about it, you just continue washing the dishes, then that's your, your first opportunity to Bingo. That's introduce the relaxation yeah. and to actually create a thought process that is supportive of the experience that you want to have. Because the thought is the first thing that happens. What we do is we wait for the experience to validate the thought process. So it's like, once I've had this experience, then I'll think positively about it. Or once I have this good thing happen, then I'll believe in myself. But the, it happens in reverse. And so you have to cultivate that sense of uh, you know, knowing within yourself that even if you haven't experienced that thing that you want to experience, whether that be you know, doing the flying change or riding at WEG or getting on your horse in, in the first stages after the groundwork, the first thing that has to happen is you have to be comfortable with the thought of that happening. And if you're not comfortable with the thought of that happening, you're not going to be comfortable with the experience of that happening. Write that down, Becca. You and have so to be comfortable with the thought. I love that line. So when that... When you have that opportunity, that's where all of the different stuff that I teach with visualisation comes into practice. It's like, okay, so here it is, I'm washing up, I have this feeling of like that little response that we all get where your breath changes and you have a little moment. What is it that I want to see? I want to see a relaxed horse, I'm going to take a breath out, I'm going to stay with this until I feel the levels dissipate in my body and then I'm going to continue on. And that's the emotional agility that we're talking about. So by the time you get to the actual experience, your thought is congruent with what it is that you want to have happen. So that's where we kind of overlook it. We have thoughts all through the week that we don't do anything about. We get to the actual thing that we want to have happen in front of us and all of a sudden we're like frozen or we can't do it or we feel like we're going to cry. And there's been so many micro opportunities prior to that to do something about it. And it's just the cumulative effect of those that are resulting in the little overflow that we get when it, when it comes to the actual follow through. That sounds exactly like my story about Robin with her panic attacks and how she practiced bringing yourself down from being slightly uptight yeah. a lot. Yeah. So there's nothing going on there. Yeah. So it would be like the thought. Yeah. Mm. So the, the thing is that you want to you practice what it is that challenges you in an environment that you can control first. So you don't want to be at the clinic or at the competition and putting that's yourself... My life. That's it, horse training right there. You took that off me, totally. That's ho yeah. I, she <laughs> stole it from me. That's horse training right there. Um, Work on the problem before the problem shows up. Yeah, yeah. yeah you know, so, and for us, the, the ability that we have as humans is to visualise a future scenario. This is like your superpower. So if you can sit at home and visualise yourself doing the thing that is a challenge or that you want to do and clock your response to that, then you want to make sure that you can sit at home and think about that and have it be okay before you get to the stage where you're actually required to do that and there's a whole other element to the equation, like a big horse. <laughs> right. You know, so... Or a enough okay that you're able to, to deal with it positively in the, you know, in the context. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah, so it's kind of the same way as what I, as what I was saying, is taking care of it in the, when it starts not when it gets really big and so yeah and jane says it's the thought so that's even better than the, the doing yeah i think there's one um maybe we're kind of wrapped up there we've got the i read that one didn't understand it so okay i think that's probably there's a question i didn't understand so i'm not even going to try to understand it and there's some really cool comments that have come up on the threads that um, we haven't, we've missed just through the way that Facebook's filtering them. Um, so I know if there's anything that I can answer independently, I'll, I'll jump on and do some blogs about it. Yeah, and the other thing is with these Facebook lives, the comments, I can't, it's not like a Facebook group where I can just scroll through the comments. That only shows you five comments at a time. 
they don't put them in order. Like the first comment might have been three hours ago, and yeah. the next comment was 10 minutes ago, and then there's a comment from six hours ago. <coughs> so it's really hard to go through and kind of check off all the answers. So if we don't get, if I don't get to your, um, to answering your question, excuse me, <coughs> if I don't get to answering your question, it's not because I didn't want to answer your question, it's probably because I didn't find it. Yeah. Oh no, Jane, when's the next clinic in Australia? <laughs> Well, Warwick Clinic's are in, you start in January. Don't January, you? I start yeah. in Victoria. Yeah, yeah, and um, well, that's confusing. I'm not sure which Australia Clinic Lee's referring to. Um, I'm hoping to get to Australia early next year, but I haven't got anything set in stone yet. When I get home, I'm home next Wednesday, New Zealand time. I'm going to sit down and um, have a look at what that might look like. Yeah. I think that's it. So I think we're all done. So yeah. hopefully that gives you guys some ideas about um, what were we supposed to be talking about? Just everything. No, but what was the... We were talking about mental training, so we're... Just now? Or no. Or the whole thing? The whole thing. Yeah, that. We were talking I thought about it was the so. Oh, the clinic research thing? No, this thing. No, that's why we... We have <laughs> we're like the Laurel and Hardy show. See, here. it's like we've gone for 90 minutes without knowing what the topic was. Right. <laughs> Um, but anyway, yeah, thank you so much for joining us. I learned a lot out of that, of the small words that I understood. <laughs> thanks, guys. That was awesome. Um, we'll do it again soon. Yeah, thanks so much for joining us. And if you guys haven't joined um, Jane's Confident Writer thing, that's where a lot of this, the, the stuff that she teaches it was a lot of the, um, you know, the backbone of the success I think we had at WEG. So if you have any issues with confidence or, you know, um, competition stuff, I think Jane would uh, be able to help you out. Thanks. <laughs> I'd love to. <laughs> no, she's very, very good. She can even get me sorted out, so she has a real talent. <laughs> All right, guys, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for joining us. We'll catch you later. Bye, guys.